Thank you. So it's very moving to be to be here. And as many of you, we have the impression that Jean-Francois is, is with us. And I can uh, tell you how much we and I miss him. I was lucky enough to be a PhD student in the late 70s. Uh, great days for game theory and general equilibrium. So I have benefited since then from Jean-Francois uh, help many times. OK, this is a talk which is a simple application of cooperative game uh, theory. So don't expect any new conceptual development. So the problem that uh, we are addressing, my colleague uh, Samuel Ferre and I, is the problem of sharing the damage that has been caused by several individuals. It's a difficult problem, and uh, historically, common law actually did not accept any apportionment. The victim had a claim against each tortfeasor, and tortfeasors could not have a claim against the others. There has been long debates. There has been a uniform contribution among tortfeasors act in 1939 revised until 1955, that opened the possibility of appointment, of apportionment, of division, division of the damage among the tortfeasors. There is a restatement of torts, several versions, 1939, 1999, that has started by providing general principle for solving this problem. So here we address that problem, how to apportion the damage caused by several tort fissures. These are lit litigation that are common in various settings, environmental law, accidental law, medical malpractice, and so on. So let's take an example. We have a car driver. There is an accident. The pedestrian has his leg broken. The victim is brought to the hospital, and there is a fault by the surgeon. And uh, I'm sorry, but the leg has to be amputated. So how to determine the compensation that the victim is ent clearly entitled to? Huh? Should, the, should the judge consider that the driver is liable for the entire damage? Or should each of them pay half or cover half of it? Or that one is uh, one of them is more liable than the others, but then then to what extent? I mean that that, that is the simple question and difficult question that uh, uh, we 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 look at in this uh, framework. Most existing model, indeed, in law and economics, put the focus on incentives, and this is in a non-cooperative setting. So there are many papers that deal with uh, in a non-cooperative setting with such a problem. Here, instead, we we focus on compensation and fairness from a cooperative point of view. And so we model the apportionment problem as a cooperative game. So incentives is about ex ante causation. I mean, it's really uh, create incentive for future behaviors, while here we are in an exposed position. The thought has been caused. Okay. So we call a judgment the specification of uh, compensation that for each of the persons involved, the tort feasors, we specify how much uh, they have to, to contribute to the, uh, to the compensation to the victim. So there is clearly a minimum compensation. Tort feasors should pay at least the damage 
that they would have caused the loan. And this is very important because here we start introducing the notion of potential damage. So this is the minimum. And the maximum is that each tortfeasor should not pay more than their additional damage, the additional damage that they have caused. The additional damage is the difference between the total damage and the damage that would have resulted uh, without the participation of that individual. Okay. So these are two bounds, but we go further, and these bounds can be found actually, these, these IDs are in the general principles. Yes, oh, sorry. What are these two numbers? Yeah, the minimum and the maximum. Yeah, what are they? Okay, the, the, the minimum is the leg broken. This is for the first. The, the, that's the minimum the driver should have to pay, clearly. Okay, and what's the maximum that he has to pay? Here, the driver, is the maximum is the total damage, actually. So, which, which is really the difference between the total damage and the damage that would have resulted from uh, if, if that person had not been involved. We. So in other words, if the driver had not <coughs> hit the guy, then. Then nothing would have happened, of course, in that case. Of course, this is the example with, is with two. It's more interesting when there are three, but I mean, we'll see. So we extend, actually, uh, we'll come back to that, because we extend the argument to subsets of tort feasors. Could use already the word coalition, of course, but I mean, yeah, in, this, in this setting. So the contribution of each subset of tort feasors, there is a minimum on what a subset of tort feasors pays, and this is the potential, their potential damage. Right? The damage that they, they would have caused without the intervention of the others. And now you see, of course, appearing the characteristic function. And the contribution of any subset of tort feasors should not exceed the additional damage resulting from their participation. So we extend this lower bound and upper bound from individuals to subsets of uh, tort feasors. And any judgment that uh, satisfy these two conditions, we call them acceptable judgment. Hopefully it will become clear in an instant, if you don't mind. We distinguish two levels, because we assume a lot has already been done after the accident has occurred. So there is an objective level. Experts have asserted the role of each player, of each tort feasors, in order to determine the additional damage that each of them caused. Okay? And there is a subjective level. This is the judge that has to, be de to determine the degree of responsibility of each player. Okay. So, okay, in that case, of course, there is, no, they are both really jointly responsible and there is no way to So, uh, repeat then the, your example. Maybe so I didn't. Two people shooting at the same time, someone is going to die. So both bullets, he's hit by both bullets. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's and, and, and then, of course, you know that they spend a lot of time in determining which bullet has killed the person. Huh? And if eventually they don't succeed, then, of course, uh, this will be typically, of course, uh, they are really jointly responsible. And uh, the damage has occurred. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's a unanimity game. Do you agree with this? So typically, uh, you will divide it in two, because they are completely... Yeah, but
Uh, yes. So, so it sounds like there is a, a mismatch between like the maximum that you have to pay may be smaller than the minimum you have to pay. Okay, we'll come back to that. So, uh, because what we analyze, although in the paper we also consider the simultaneous case, case we analyze a sequential case. Okay, so we have. <laughs> I'm sure each time, each time I present the seminar, people have such an imagination about uh, something. <laughs> they, they kill my talk. <laughs> so please refrain yourself. After that, we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let's listen. Let's go to person down and the floor receives him on a sword. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what the result is. Okay, that's interesting. You will give me the reference. <laughs> okay, so we analyze indeed sequential situation that could be of that time. Uh, involve a number n players. They they act sequentially. And we, the sequence has been identified, and we follow actually the. Uh, uh, so we, we, we do not consider, at least in my talk, I don't consider the possibility of really what I call joint, as your example, joint causation. We have really something that is sequential, so we follow the natural ordering. We start with player one until player n. And we have one information. This is assumed to be known by on the sequence. We know what is the additional damage that each player is causing in the sequence. Okay, this is assumed to be known. It's not necessarily an easy data to, to, to agree upon, but we, we assume it is, it is given. So we have a damage vector from which we, could, we can compute cumulative damage, or which is the cost. Uh, for each player, you are at a certain point in the sequence, so you add your damage to the preceding damage. So Cn is the total damage that has to be divided. So the natural uh, li game, which I, we call liability game, uh, the characteristic function, first of all, of course, in any uh, coalition in which player one is not present, doesn't cause any, cause any damage. Any, if you have a coalition that contains a complete string from one to i, and i plus one is not in the sequence, then we stop at CI, okay? This is the total cost, of course, the total damage that is to be divided. And in particular, if you remove player I from the grand coalition, you stop at CI minus one. So C1, C2, CI minus one, okay? So just to be sure, a three-player three, three player case. So we have player one, where is it? Player one, cause D1, and the coalition 1, 3, 2 is not present, so we stop at D1, which is C1, actually. 1, 2, they caused D1, D2, so that's C2. 2 and 3, 1 is not there, and the total cost is the sum of the uh, uh, three additional damage, C3. Okay. One, two, four, you stop. One, two, four, yes, yes, exactly. So, of course, if you are familiar with airport games, you, you will see that there is a clear connection with airport games. So, a judgment is a vector that specifies a contribution by each player that covers the uh, total cost. So, I, I use this notation in the, in the slides to simplify the notation. The victim could be, have some responsibility at some point. Uh, we can come to that. So the core, yes, it doesn't come. This is our RN. So the core, this is the uh, definition for a TU game. Uh, it's an allocation of the 
value of the game, the worth of the grand coalition, and no coalition can improve upon. We know that these inequalities here, using this equality, this identity there, can be written with a complementary coalition, so that clearly core allocation are acceptable judgment. And now you recognize the definition. V of S is the potential damage of coalition S. So uh, we have the lower bound. Each coalition should pay at least its potential damage, but not more than its additional damage, which is that the difference between the total cost and the cost that uh, the damage that would have been caused without uh, the coalition. Okay, so core and uh, uh, acceptable judgment. This is synonymous. Uh, because of the sequential structure, the uh, uh, many inequalities defining the core are redundant, so the core can be defined in this way. Uh, and you observed already that uh, no players pays for uh, damage that have, have been caused upstream. You only pay for the damage uh, the upstream. You don't pay for damage that has been caused downstream. Okay. We'll uh, this is quite natural. So we observe that there are several particular allocations. The first one, of course, is we observe that player one in any case pays at least D1. There is no way out. There is an allocation by which the first player pays everything. It's a core allocation. It's an acceptable judgment. And then there is this allocation, which many lawyers would say, but that's natural. You just ask each one to pay his additional damage, his or her additional damage. And indeed, the vector of damages is a core allocation. It's an acceptable judgment. Mm -hmm. So in, in, this is in terms, in individual terms. In particular, of course, the last player will never pay more than its additional damage. Okay. I suppose it's clear. So. What, what, what is the next uh, concept that we would like to look at? It's, of course, the Shapley value. So to define the Shapley value, we start with player orderings. We define marginal contribution vectors. You know the parabola. Huh? Player one enters a room, receives his marginal contribution. Player two comes in, receives his marginal contribution. So to each ordering, we can associate an imputation which uh, uh, is uh, attached to that ordering. In the three-player case, there are four distinct vectors. There are always, of course, three uh, six, but distinct, there are only four. These two we already have seen. And these two, I will say more about it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instant. So graphically, what we do have, uh, we have the triangle of imputation, which is player one, player two, player three the lower bound for player one, so these are the imputations. And then I have only one additional uh, constraint def to define the core, so that this area here is the set of acceptable judgment. Okay. So we observe that actually the vertices of the core, the vertices of the core are the marginal contribution vectors. This is a characteristic of convex game. And indeed, liability games are convex. One way to prove it is very simple, is to show that liability games are duels of airport games. And airport games are known to be concave as cost games. So liability games are uh, convex. Okay. We use Shapley 1971 result that the core of a convex game is the polyhedron, both vertices are the marginal contribution vectors, which is actually a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, convexity. And if we look at the marginal contribution vectors, actually it's easy to build them, because these are vectors at which some players or subset of players can be exempted from uh, paying a contribution. And this must be done in a consistent way. 
you can be exempted, but at some point, here, for example, player three is exempted, so player two must support the total uh, damage d2 plus d3. So in general, let's, let's look at an example. In the six-player case, there is only one possibility in which player six, four, and two are exempted. Again, under that constraint that the player never pays for damage caused downstream. Okay. So a judge may decide to exempt some players. We know that the first player cannot be completely exempted. The Shapley value, you know it, is the average marginal contribution vector. By convexity, it's a core. Uh, in general, it's a core uh, allocation. Therefore, for liability games, it defines an acceptable judgment. It's a neutral compromise. Tort feasors differ only in their contribution to the damage. Equal responsibility. The judge does not consider that there is any, because there could be reasons, of course, to uh, exempt partly or completely some tort feasors in case where a child has committed some uh, mistake. Maybe the judge can consider that the responsibility is not included or that someone is really heavily responsible because of some misconduct uh, and so on. Okay, so that's the subjective level uh, that is involved. Yes, Shwen? What is the idea of taking for, uh, random order for the family value? That indeed, yes, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. The formula for the Shapley value. I'm using random order. There's only a formula. It's a, it's, it, uh, it is a proof of the theorem that there is a unique value satisfying uh, the axiom of the value. It's a formula. Don't take it. People have a tendency okay. to, to give these yeah. orders uh, some meaning, but think of it only as something satisfying the axiom. So in, if you think of this as a game, yeah, uh, which uh, has an existence in its own right, then it's Shapley value. Is it Shapley value? Yeah, but the one, fact that you have uh, a, a random order is irrelevant. So but, one, but one of the implications of the order is helping you in defining the characteristic function. So the story, the order is set only for the characteristic function. But you're, you're right that in a sense it's a bit confusing because here I'm talking about orders. Taking the other well-known expression of the Shapley value, which is a weighted average of marginal contribution, would of course not meet this R, this problem. Okay. It is. It will be like that, yes. One part of the exercise, you are trying to allocate damage, and you have to think of what would have happened if something else, if the order would be different, yeah. if some, some one of them would not have been there. You, you have to do, you have to think of alternative scenarios, that's the whole point. Because in that scenario, you can just say, the first one did this, the second did this, the second did this, and you go home. But, uh, let let me sense. proceed. So, I mean, I can experiment. What would have happened? So liability games are dual support games, and there is a proposition that uh, says that the value of a game and its dual actually coincide. So uh, there is uh, an another way, of course, is to, to, to observe that liability game can be decomposed as a sum of elementary unanimity games of that form. So here I can decompose the... Uh, Unanim unanimity, uh, the, the liability games as a sum of unanimity games with respect to this coalition, one to i. Using symmetry and null player, we know that what is the Shapley value of a unanimity games, so that we get this very simple formula, which is nothing else than the airport uh, formula. 
which is the natural, natural uh, way. Huh? So you divide the last damage among all players, and then the uh, uh, preceding uh, uh, in damage among the n minus one players until you get to d1. So that's a natural, uh, 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 a natural division in case there is no reason to differentiate the players in terms of degree of responsibility. So location of the Shapley value somewhere there in the core because these two vectors count twice in the computation of the Shapley value. So now how to account for asymmetries? Shapley's already in 1953 introduced the idea of weights that led, has led to the notion of weighted value and what these weights represent depend, of course, on the context. There are a few examples. Not many applications I know of uh, weighted Shapley value. So here, a judge may assign weights to tort feasors. And uh, that can go as far as ex exempting some participant, of course, of uh, contributing. So. Just to recall, we have a vector of weights. The weighted Shapley value is just the average marginal contribution vectors that is computed. Yep, 15 minutes, thank you. Which is computed uh, with respect to the probability distribution induced by W on the set of players' orderings. What we observed is that this probability distribution if, that, if, if it is normalized, if I normalize the weights, WI is a probability that player I is last in a permutation. Okay. Equal weights, this is a symmetric Shapley value, and you can generate the set of all weighted values by considering limits for some but not all weights tending to zero. Okay. The if I look at the weighted Shapley value of T unanimity games, this is uh, what we, we obtain. And uh, using additivity and the decomposition, uh, the Shapley value with weight W of reliability games is very, of course, similar to uh, its uh, symmetric part. So what you get is, of course, that each time you weight the additional damage by the relative probabilities that are there. Okay. We know from uh, Monderer, Samet, Chaplet that the core is a subset of the set of weighted Chaplet value. And uh, we know that the core, so that the core is a subset of the set of weighted value. And the Weber set, which is the convex hull of the marginal contribution vectors, is a superset of the set of weighted Chaplet value. In con for convex games, therefore, the core and the set of weighted values are identical. So that means that weighted values are core allocation and that weights can be associated to core allocation. Applied to liability games, it means that weighted values are acceptable judgments and vice versa, that acceptable judgments reveal weights. Okay. So for instance, this is I've not, never seen this being used in any way in the literature, by the way, is just to take the simple average of core vertices for convex games, which, by the way, give very strange results uh, when you apply it to bankruptcy game. And, uh, by the way, the, uh, the figures that are in the Talmud, if you compute the average of the marginal contribution vectors, gives exactly the same result. But if you apply it to other you obtain uh, strange behavior of this average where some people receive that have larger claims receive less. But it, in fact, it turns out that the, uh, the figures of the Talmud, but just, just a parenthesis, I address myself to Bob, Bob about that, but, uh, that apply to the figures that are in the Talmud, the average of marginal contribution vectors reproduce exactly the, the figures in the Talmud. For, so here, the weights that are revealed are well defined, one fourth, one fourth, one half. And actually what is strange is that it does not depend on the number of players in the sense that the, second, the last player pays always half of its, his or her additional damage while the other pay one divided by two n minus one. 
So the same weight for the all other players, which has no special meaning, of course. The allocation that, of course, imposed to the first player, the initiator, to pay the full cost correspond to weight, normalized weight, where it's zero for everybody except for that, uh, that player. And what about the allocation that gives, uh, ask each player to pay uh, the ad exactly the additional damage? it corresponds to a limit, which is quite strange because it's a limit, and this is a mistake, sorry. Uh, it should be zero is the last one, so I have to correct this. This is one for the last one and zero for all the others. It, the idea is that the last one is more responsible, player n is more responsible than player n minus one, which is more responsible, and therefore the last to be most more responsible is the player, player one, actually. So this is this allocation uh, correspond to uh, particular uh, evaluation or by the judge. So what we have shown is that the core uh, defines acceptable shipment, Shapley value. It's a particular one, the weights. So I will not repeat that. So this is what we have seen. And the symmetric, just last slide, the symmetric Shapley value stands as a particular and attractive rule because it's, uh, at least when there is no reason to differentiate the players by on what they have committed in terms of damage. And uh, I rely on young 1985 uh, axiomatization of the Shapley value, which use, of course, symmetry. There is no doubt about that. And this can be found uh, in, in, in all... Uh, uh, discussion on taught uh, uh, allocation, equal treatment of equal symmetry, so uh, players that have contributed equally to potential damage uh, should contribute equal amounts. And the second is marginalism. There is clearly a allusion to this, is that what a player pays depends exclusively on his or her contribution to potential damage independently of the way uh, the other contribute to damage, which is, of course, a strong axiom, which is actually very close to additivity. Of course, this we know. Okay. I have considered the pure sequential game. Now, if all players act simultaneously, which means that really jointly, there is no way to differentiate them, then we are facing a unanimity game. And using the weights, we get, of course, this uh, allocation. Or in the... Uh, in the symmetric case, of course, would be 1 over nc. In the paper, I consider, uh, we consider the possibility that along the sequence, there may be a group of players that act jointly. Maybe at the beginning, maybe in the middle. That's it. Thank you. Now, this I have not done. This is something that should be done. Uh, you're right. That means to, to have a, an axiomatization of the Shapley value on liability game that will be the same as for airport games. I have, I have not checked it. Is it possible to have a game in which you can apply symmetry? I don't think so. You could have symmetry games there. The liability game? Yeah, if a player... Sequentiality means that it's possible to apply symmetry. I have not excluded... I have not... Yes, no, you're right. But I mean, in the sequential case, I have not excluded an additional damage at some point in the sequence to be zero. You can... Uh, be there, cause no additional damage, but because you're there, it continues. So in that case, the two successive pairs are identical. But uh, I, I don't know about... Uh, So, 
I, I have assumed that the, there, is, there has been a preliminary <laughs> cleaning of the... No, of course, no, I mean, if you are there, many, many persons are responsible for you being there, so that's... <laughs> so so we, we, we hope that the judge is uh, clever enough to, of course, retain the group of people that have really contributed to the damage. I mean, here, uh, <laughs> even if that, per that person has, in your example, has caused no additional damage and could be asked to contribute. But clearly, a judge will... Uh, yes? Seems critical, but chronological order is very important. Yes. Yes, that's why we need to clarify when the publication was published, 71 or 72. <laughs> and second, could it be applied for a war game? You consider this as a damage? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. 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 For example, hockey game, who gave fast to pull and finals? He wants more optimistic examples. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I agree, yes. 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 Yes, 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 you're right. There's a question there. No, no, you're right. We allude to that in the in the paper, but uh, we have not uh, uh, digged into that. Thank you.